Welcome to another episode of Racket Society. Today we are thrilled to be joined by my good friend Tim Monroe, a uh, music curator, flautist, uh, performer of all things orchestral chamber, just an all around mensch and a uh, gentleman and a scholar. I'm so excited that you could join us. Uh, I also have my friend here, Sezi Sesker, who you heard in the first episode with her great playlist. And uh, Tim's going to talk to us about the playlist that he has provided for us this week. But uh, Tim, tell us about this list. What were you thinking about when you when you made this? Um, well, thanks, Chris. And it's lovely to meet you. E meet you, Sezi. Um, so I feel like I've put together a lot of playlists over the years, you know, as Spotify came up particularly. Um, and I'm always looking to be uh, sort of uh, varied and cool and uh, like I have my finger on the pulse. And, you know, the, the pandemic has done many things, but one of the things it's done for me is it's just like exposed my exposed myself as a true like vulnerable my all of my vulnerabilities and i'm just done lying in those ways in those small ways you know the small lie playlists um and so i just this playlist is everything that i have been finding solace in in the last really like 10 to 12 months and i think there's a sense that in the in the pandemic many people have been going back to stuff of their youth um it, we can find real comfort in things that when we were really little and we were first learning about music and about art and about um uh theater and film and tv those things really stick and for me it was always old 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 music like my very, I mean, not even super old, but like Monteverdi was my first love. You know, at the age of 15, I like got a, I got a copy of Orfeo, the opera, and um, just burned a hole in it. And then the Vespers and on and on from there. And I feel like in the pandemic, I've been kind of rushing backwards in time for myself, but also like rushing backwards in time to a moment when music was just like, this quiet thing that couldn't have amplification that barely was for an audience that so much of it was just like for the creator themselves. And I guess in some ways for God. Um, and somehow it just like found, it, it like gave me such peace. Um, and so I've kind of the, my playlist is basically just like a whole lot of old music in an order that, that like made some sense to me, but sort of goes forward in time in a janky way. Um, so yeah. should I talk, should I talk, should I talk you through like my choices or like what, what appeals to me about particular tracks? May I ask a question? This? Yeah. So I, I, I was just like listening to it. And then one thing that kind of like was interesting to me was, as you say, it sort of goes pretty much chronologically and it starts really, really early. So like, I absolutely, I mean, love it Monteverdi too. And I, I sort of like have a very similar relationship to it that whenever I want to calm down, it will be Monteverdi plus Bach, actually the father Bach you have here another kind of like lesser known Bach whom I love by the way, and I didn't know. So I want you to uh, tell us more about Johann Christian Bach so that we actually kind of like get to know how you know his music. Because, I mean, that's not your obvious Bach, right? Uh, there are so yeah. many other Bachs until you get to Christian Bach. So that's why it's sort of interesting. And I, I, I hope that you can tell us a little bit about that. But I also want you to talk a little bit about how come actually you find solace in kind of like Dufay and Josquin de Pré. Like what makes you kind of like go that much back rather than stopping at Monteverdi? Yeah, there's, there's, I feel like Monteverdi is like a person that I can kind of know a little bit, you know, we know a lot about his life, the way that his music interacts with emotions and storytelling is, is not unfamiliar to us. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, the track that I, the track that I, uh, the track that I chose of Monteverdi's is just like my very favorite Monteverdi track of all time. I made an arrangement once for the group that I used to play in eighth blackbird. And it just, it feels like a thing that could have been written 10 minutes ago. Um, and so there's that sense for me that Monteverdi feels like a beginning of a modernness. And then as I start to step back, it's like I go further and further into the shadows. And um, I don't know what it is about that that appeals to me. 
Um, maybe it's okay feeling lost. And I do sort of feel lost in these kind of webs of sound. You know, the, the, um, one of the Josquin um, pieces I chose was a piece in 24 parts, 24 individual parts. And it just creates this, um, this giant web um, that I just sort of feel like I'm lost, almost like a fog, like a beautiful smelling fog that I'm just like, I can't quite find my way through. But I give myself over to that somehow. Yeah, that's amazing. That track is amazing, uh, especially because it sounds contemporary. It sounds like contemporary, like looped ambient electronic, like sampled music because of that emphasis on like a sort of tight register and how it's sort of all overlapping with itself, the massive reverb. And I was super, I mean, I'm super impressed by this playlist for a few reasons. And I know that in your heart of hearts, you're a composer because the way you laid out the like textural development of this playlist is like ligety or something. I mean, starting with these like super <laughs> like like small room, almost no reverb, individual voices where we sort of like get introduced to this music and the sort of contrapuntal complexity of it and the sort of sound of human voices almost that are kind of an every person voice, even though these are like highly trained and very amazing singers, but there's something about just hearing like a senza vibrato, pure tone, especially in the first few tracks and the layering in of then like female voices and then the layering in of like space with reverb until you get to this like giant Jascan uh, track of like just massive cathedral feeling and then starting introducing like instrumental sounds back to the solo voices. I mean, I was like really taken by just the development of of instrumentation and space in this playlist and it like immerses you more and more in the sound of just people making sound with their voice which is of course like, well it's sort know, of the earliest that's be, that's so nice of you to say that um i think in some ways that's a byproduct of the fact that this is almost an a, a, a re um a backwards version of my own journey through the pandemic where like it was much more about knowable things and instruments and and kind of like big spaces down smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And like, essentially I'm only listening to things nowadays at this moment, which is like how few people can we involve? And so that, that Ockigam track, the first track is just, I, I had always understood him. So, so like just as a tiny bit of background, I mean, that era of music, when it was, when there's more than one kind of moving part, you know, when there's polyphony in that time, it's basically all from one zone in Europe. So it's like a tiny, tiny space, like, um, you know, a few hundred square miles. Um, and Ockingham always seemed like this weirdo to me that was, was like completely beyond my, you know, just boring, just too much thinkiness, not enough, repetition but that i came upon this track and it just is like be bewitching it's just these two voices it's so simple it's just these two voices that are just like kind of um spinning around one another one is singing a, a tune that at the time was pretty well known and that composers at the time would do that they would take well-known melodies and essentially just like spin them out into kind of fantasias their own sort of like strange versions and um, this one, because it's not eight other voices, because it's not 12 other voices, it's just one other voice. Somehow it's just like so transfixing. I don't know. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it's great. Um, you were mentioning the Josquin. I mean, Josquin is like coming closer. I think as I'm thinking about this playlist, as I was putting it together, I was like, oh, I just like nice tunes. Like I'm still looking, even in this like unknowable, weird, oldie timey, I'm still looking for like really nice tunes. And so like Josquin, you get again and again in his music, there's those like pretty simple, beautiful things that are like layered and layered and layered. And so in that, like the 24 voice um, motet, it's just like, bum, ba, da, da, da. Bum, ba, da, da. Bum, ba, bum, ba, da. I mean, it's just like, I mean, I like the connection with ambient music. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, there's a reason that like a lot of, you know, musical creators now are like, whether it's classical or whatever, are like very drawn to like very, very old things. Yeah, 
I mean, I, I can think of like uh, a lot of contemporary pop and electronic music also uses what are called vocal chops, like just little fragments of voice um, formats and things like that, like to basically make a sampler out of like vocal formats and formats. And I feel like that second Jascan track, the uh, wood nymphs or the forest nymphs has really intense vowel formats in it. I don't know if that's something What's you were, a, like, What does that mean? Well, I don't know what that so, means. So like What's really a pronounced form? like A-E-I-O, like when they change formats, it's like ah, ooh, ee. And so like, oh, uh, yes. uh, I found that like so fascinating in that track. And actually it feels very contemporary because there's a ton of music right now in which, I mean, it would be done electronically, like just chopping out those parts of a vocal sample and then sort of playing them back on a keyboard or something. Um, but uh, that track in particular, I thought just had like this really wild overtone quality because of how intense the the instrumentalists were about changing the vowels very fast and very sharp and almost sounds That's, like a sample. Yeah, I've become, th this is a West Coast based group. Um, uh, like I sort of think of European music like of this era as like only the Europeans are making it, but there are some amazing American groups and this group um, cut circle uh, really, really um, doing amazing work. And one of the things that they're doing is they're capturing this like very strange, unknowable, like not unknowable, this very strange vocal style. Um, and uh, they're really wanting to, um, to put all of the emotion into this music, which can sometimes when it's performed be very kind of like at arm's length. And so there is that like tangy quality that I love that idea of um, those different, the vowels that like the vowels are like so such different colors. That's cool. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever heard the early like synthesized speech from like the mid 20th century that they were trying to do with like telephone operators and stuff like that. Maybe at Bell Laboratories or somewhere like this, but it has this quality of uh, just like- No, what's that? Sharply Tell me. contrasting vowels and things like that. What's I that? I think they were just trying to invent a synthesizer that could could resynthesize like human speech, um, but it's worth worth checking out. It has a really cool cool sound to it. Hmm. And of course, now it's like a throwback electronic sample, so it's very hip, you know. <laughs> Unlike this playlist. <laughs> oh, this playlist is very hip though because of the last track, which you know. <laughs> I, I know Sazie had some thoughts about this. I mean, she was just mentioning that before we started recording that like her daughter absolutely loves this track, but it does recast yes. the whole thing. It does, especially because the last track actually starts with this kind of like string bass that makes you think that it is going to be yet another one of those tracks similar to the ones that came before it. But then it turns out to be something totally different and you're like, oh, okay, so we are in today now. Okay. Um, but it's it's really kind of like upbeat. I, I sort of like can see that piece working as a kind of, all right, we just woke up, let's listen to something kind of track. But it could also be, you just cried and then you're wiping your tears and you're like, okay, let's listen to something kind of track as well. So I sort of like, like that it fits to so many situations. So tell us about that group and why you're oh, listening that's super, to that. That's super interesting. What a lovely way of, of capturing that in-between quality. Cause I think I've always, I mean, I've, I've loved the new pornographers for a decade and I, I never have quite been able to work out why I'm like, I don't listen to a lot of pop, popular music of like various genres. I mean, not for any reason other than just like my whole life has been just like immersed in classical music. But um, the new pornographers have been making much more of an appearance because we have a 15 month old and he's just like starting to be like really excited by, about, about music. And this is just like new pornographers make just great, just um, big anthem -y dance tracks that just like are fun to dance to. Um, but what I'd forgotten is how amazing their like really intimate songs are. And um, that this one, which is like, it feels hopeful, but also there's a sadness to it. And I had to Google it because their lyrics can be sort of uh, oblique or like poetic and, and a little bit abstract. Um, is that it's essentially about uh, being the friend of somebody who's coming out of a deep depression. Mm. And so there is a sadness there um, but there is also a sense of hope in it. Um, it also felt like I love Sazie, your sense that it, it begins almost like it could be another lament somehow. Right, right. Um, and I did sort of think of it as like, because it is, 
it has that lament like quality that there are lots of kind of i mean i feel like the olden times they did laments better than anything <laughs> Totally. And that, like the the Johann Christoph Bach um, track, the um, is like part of an entire album, which is just only laments. And I feel like that whole era of German music, which is kind of like early seventeenth century, it's like pre the famous Bach, like around the time of Monteverdi, maybe a little bit after. Um, they just knew how to do sad things so well, extremely well. It's yes. so and so simple. And maybe that's the other thing that I love about the new pornographers track is it's it's no more complex or more simple than these these laments that are like than the Ockergum or than the Schutz or than the Bach, the J C Bach. I feel like I forget which how J C Bach is related. He's older uh, than J S Bach, but I can't remember how much. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I sort of only remember that they're supposed to be cousins, apparently, basically. Oh, but cousins. He's, he's absolutely new to me, actually. Because, I mean, perhaps because I'm a pianist, too. I mean, if I'm going to listen to any other Bach than the father Bach, it's always C.P. Bach, you know? I mean, right. that's basically... Or Johann... Uh, now I'm Christian Bach. No, not, yeah, I'm not actually mis mixing them up. This is Yes, Christoph. that's right. I uh, Yeah, Christian Bach is the cousin and Christoph Bach is a more, he's like more, he's older, but like also more obscure relative, I feel like. Um, we would have to look that up. So he's like um, the, cool, the cool cousin with like the record collection that Bach like yeah. hung out with when he was a kid. And he... <laughs> well, he was like the, he was like the emo one. Like Bach <laughs> went up, Bach went up to his attic and they like listened to like, um, they listen to like moody emo records together. <laughs> yeah, because there's a whole, there's like a whole genre of this kind of lament that um, it just hits you in the heart. I was sharing some of it with you, Chris, right early in the pandemic. I feel like I was like overdosing on it. Um, I bought an entire, I bought a like a 40 CD collection of early German music because I just wanted to like see what is all of this strange stuff? Like, where is it even coming from? Um, yeah, that's awesome. I mean, just lyrically, you know, like uh, I, I looked it up and it's like, oh, that I had water enough in my head and that my eyes were springs of tears so that I could bewail my sin night and day. My sin overwhelms me. You know, it just lyrically is so intense and so beautiful. And just like, I mean, yeah, in this moment we're in, it's just, it hits you hard, I think. Right. And what about the what about the singer in that track? Oh, okay, Daniel can you tell Taylor. Us so, about that? Yeah. well, he's a so he's a Canadian. He's a Canadian countertenor who I've just always loved as this. Just like, I feel like there is there are the the two kind of like general strains of countertenors. One is the kind of like more like choiry sort of like choir like right. one that that kind of is more like hooty. I don't know if that's a, and the other is like more kind of big and operatic. It's right. like. What is your just giant vo voluptuous vibrato laden virtuoso, you know, doing all these kind of Baroque operas and showing like fireworks, fireworks like crazy. And Daniel Taylor is just like, feels like he's sort of neither. He's just like very simple. It's very, it's an incredibly beautiful instrument. Yeah. I've always been very drawn to hear his voice. He, um, I was, I, even just as I was like putting this track down, I was noticing what he, he's doing more conducting these days. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, like, I didn't know him actually before, and I, I like it quite a bit the way the way that he sings it. Yeah, and, I also go ahead, Susan. Uh, I also want to definitely hear about Salva Regina. Um, oh my god! Oh my god! That's the point at which you're sort of like going a little bit backwards, aren't you? Absolutely, I didn't know where else to put it. It's like a big, <laughs> it's like a giant fifteen minute. It's just like who even knows where to put that? I knew I wanted to have the new pornographers last. Um, but I didn't know where to put that. So, okay, actually, this composer, uh, Nico Muley, put me on to this era of English music. It's uh -huh. very, it's sort of weird because it comes at a time when uh, England's like in all of this craziness over religion. So they don't know whether to be stay Catholic. They don't know whether to become full Protestants. They don't know whether to be in between. They don't know whether to murder people because of it. <laughs> You know, they don't know whether to have an English translation of the Bible. You know, it's it's like crazy times. You know, a lot of people died. Just a lot of people died. And not just Henry VIII's um, wives. So this comes from slightly before that time. But the, it's an era of English music where there's almost nothing left. 
because it was all destroyed when there was all this big kind of anti-Catholic stuff. I can't remember which queen was like so, so, so unbelievably fervently anti-Catholic, but she just like, they just laid waste to all of these archives and things. And so there's almost nothing left. Almost nothing is known about these people. Um, there's a bunch of them. John Brown is another. Um, there's there's like a handful of these composers and there were probably dozens and dozens more. And it's a very specific and unique style, right? It's just like these giant, giant textures wow. that just overwhelm you. And it's always led by these like piercingly high um, soprano parts. Amazing. And everything like, else is where basically... Where do you get those sopranos? I mean, it's really hard to get those sopranos. Well, and not just that, like to do it for 15 minutes. All right. of these things. It's a genre called the antiphon. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this era, it feels like those a votive antiphon. And that uh, there was... A, they're always giant pieces. They're always 15 to 20 minutes long. They set an enormous, an incredibly long text... Um, I forget what their function is like in the liturgy, but essentially it's just like this wackadoo amount of music for people to be singing. I mean, it must have been, it's just an incredible stamina feat, if nothing else. But also I just mostly wanted to put it on this list just because like no one, it's, it's such a, it's such a unique and specific corner. Um, there's yeah, only a couple of little, I never yeah, heard of the composer and... I think right. I looked on Wikipedia that there's only four pieces or something that survive of his, his output or something like that. Super yeah. fascinating. Totally. And I think maybe another thing to say about even other, the composers earlier on this, like they didn't think of themselves as composers. That word didn't even exist until coming on for, you know, some, some way through the 16th century. So most of these people were like, they took clerical orders. I don't know if that's a correct term. And they basically were administrators who like sang. Singing was an important part of the thing, but like they didn't write music for money. It was not like a thing. It was not. Uh, it was not kind of a big. Um, it wasn't a, like a defined role, right? You weren't like a composer. So yeah, uh, I, but. I sort of wondered kind of about like pushing the range of the sopranos so high because it cannot be just like a random choice. It had to be a kind of like, you know, on purpose, you sort of like push someone's voice to the absolute kind of like, you know, borders of what they are capable of doing. Something that, for example, you know, you also kind of like know Beethoven to do, you know, he right. always pushes you just a little too far because he gets a kick out of that, you know, for pushing you there. Well, and so, because, I mean, is that yeah. something like that? Because it, I, angelic doesn't quite describe the highness of that voice. It's beyond <laughs> angelic. Well, yeah, I mean, it's funny that you bring up an angels because that piece is in nine parts, I think, if I'm remembering right, because that's like what the number of groups of angels there are or like nine categories of angels. So there is like a little bit of that kind of feeling. But I think your point is super interesting. Um, the thing that happens to instruments or instrumentalists or, or singers when we're pushed to the edge is like we can get a real roughness or we can get a real intensity. Right. Um, and... I have to think, you know, some of this, we don't think of like virtuosity as a thing. Oh, I don't think of virtuosity as like related to early music in a particular way. But a lot of this stuff is really, really hard. One of the pieces we haven't talked about, the Dufay, the Guillaume Dufay track, um, I, I included because like he entranced me with just like such how beautiful the like soaring lines are in his stuff. Like it just feels like um you know romantic melodies in sometimes but also it's like incredibly virtuosic in terms of like the rhythms it's asking for um and in terms of like the the coloratura for want of a better term like all the all the fast notes um but oh my god the stub at mata what a what it must have been considered to be incredibly virtuoso i mean you gotta think right i think that's a great point yeah, the soprano yeah. is amazing on that recording as well. And uh, like you said, the the melismatic quality of it is incredible. There's also some just pretty out harmonic moments in that piece. Um, 
just from these weird points in which notes have to be flatted or natural in various contexts and they sort of happen in quick succession and so you get like bordering on like augmented triads and things i mean strange stuff which i mean geek out composer thing was i was totally into just like wow that's <laughs> well like but amazing. it's and it's super it's super interesting because like i think a lot of those questions have to be guessed at yeah there's a lot of guessing that goes on and well a lot an incredible amount of research but like a little bit of guessing and i think there's like a is that that term there's a term for that like um, music effecta is mm -hmm. maybe the thing that refers to like how what the, because they didn't write all of the like things that should be high things that should be low it's like um a little bit um in the common practice and so yeah i i guess like when i'm listening to this music i'm always like a little bit like the the pungent things i'm like oh interesting <laughs> is that a thing that would have been heard at the time yeah or it would it not have been but also like how did they hear that is an augmented triad like does that sound rich and beautiful to them in a way that like it sounds a little bit weird to us it's like who are these people <laughs> who even are That's they right. like what if we met them if i just like transported into my living room right now um what on earth would we talk like what would we talk about what would yeah what would their lives have been well they'd be excited to know that some australian living in chicago is listening listening to their tunes and <laughs> Uh, I think this playlist in general has a really wonderfully like cinematic quality. And <clears throat> again, I was talking about the textural development, all that. And then when you arrive at that Salve Regina, which is just like <clears throat> incredibly grandiose and beautiful. And then getting that new pornographer's track is like a coda that for me just completely changed the way that I viewed the whole playlist. And all of a sudden made me, why I say cinematic is it made me feel like I was in like a Merchant Ivory film or something. And there was, uh, you know, like two priests riding bicycles as the camera faded out or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You know, I actually, I was, as I put it in, I was like, oh, this is totally the credits track. <laughs> well, it has that though. It's really nice, which it makes it feel very like up to date and, uh, and maybe want to immediately go back and listen to the whole playlist again, like hearing the, the new pornographers. And of course, I mean, you get the, the interesting vocal writing in the new pornographers track too, to show that there is also this dynamic call and response between female vocals, and male vocals, kind of like what was happening in the Monteverdi earlier. Like there's just so many threads in this. And this is why I say, I think you're a composer. You like manage all of that content. Like are all those threads are like tied up and that's pretty impressive for just a Spotify playlist. You know, it's a, a <laughs> that's feat. True. And the the other quality of like that the, the fact that that threat made my daughter just dance around like at eight in the evening in the living room repeatedly has something about like how it kind of like brings people together it has that kind of vibe to it as well right you could be listening to it as a family like like a very friendly german beer garden where everybody's <laughs> having a good time together basically <laughs> it's a bit like that i love that that's great that's beautiful that has been a thread in a lot of these playlists, though, is this idea of people being together. I haven't noticed right. that, but it's uh, this is the third one that we've we've done an interview and listened to and like uh, thought about, and you know this idea of people getting together and singing songs, like in the earlier tracks in this playlist, or uh, you know then music in this that makes you sort of remember the times you hung out with friends and listened to tunes. And I think we all really certainly miss that quality, and this Absolutely. is hopefully a nice little um, you know reprieve to be able to at least listen to some people talk about this stuff that they love and listen to some music and think that maybe hopefully you're having a conversation with some some friends which is very nice beautifully said beautifully said well thank you so much tim it's a pleasure thank you Sezi. great to see you both um you know your pandemic hair i think is slightly more under control than mine both of you i feel like I'm slightly envious <laughs> although maybe your beard is a little longer i uh, but uh, have, uh, thank you so much again. Can't thank you enough. And uh, we'll get this yeah, up thank you too. soon. This was great. But well, thank, you, thank you, guys. Thanks for listening. And yeah. <laughs>